Good evening. You're watching a Think Tech Global broadcast. This show is Asian Review, and I'm your host, David Day. Our, our program today, we're going to be talking about China's new Air Defense Identification Zone, or ADIZ. And uh, to help us with this conversation, to provide some, some rather uh, unusual and, uh, in a lot of ways, very, very uh, remarkable insights, um, we have the uh, current CEO of Pacific Enterprise Capital, Mr. Michael Sikarski, with us uh, coming in from Houston, Texas. And uh, Mike, it's great to have you on the show again. Well, David, I'm delighted to be back. Um, for those of you who, who don't know of uh, Michael Sikarski, uh, Mr. Sikarski has, has really has a phenomenal career as an American executive who has lived and worked in China uh, as, as both an executive in a management capacity as well as an entrepreneur for some three plus decades. I know if I give you the exact number, Mike, you're probably going to smack me at some point in time. But I think one of the things that, that, that Mr. Sikarski will bring to this particular program are some, some very unusual insights into the Chinese thinking behind this new uh, air defense identification zone strategy. And uh, Mike, just to, to kind of get started with our audience here, um, uh, you might want to look at uh, photograph number one there, uh, just so that you, Michael, have it. And Mr. Producer, get ready to put that one up yet, uh, not yet, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, behind me you'll see a map, and I am, uh, this map is important to our discussions uh, to kind of focus you on this. And uh, because I, I'm in front of the map, either I, either I got to get out of the way or we're going to put the map in front of me so that you can see it. And uh, uh, let's do that now, Mr. Producer, with photograph number one. And uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, last month, this is uh, shortly before Thanksgiving, uh, China announced that it had established an air defense identification zone, ADIZ. And so if you're looking at the map on your screen there, uh, that's the, the uh, uh, kind of the red shaded area, and you'll see a, a, a dark, like a dark rectangle in the center of that. That is the new air defense uh, zone. It comes all the way back to a red border that comes around the coast of uh, uh, China. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that border represents the territorial, legal territorial limits of the People's Republic of China. Now the, the blue, solid blue line on your screen there, uh, that is Japan's air defense identification zone, and you can see that the two of them overlap. Uh, to make matters even more complicated, you'll see a red dotted line that comes along uh, roughly on an arc from, from Taipei, Taiwan, and skims up along the edge of the southern Japanese islands, the Okinawa Islands. That red dotted line is the exclusive economic zone claimed by China. And then on the flip side, you see a blue dotted line, uh, and that is the exclusive economic zone claimed by Japan. As you can see, they overlap. And finally, uh, at the top of your screen, you'll see a white solid border that uh, cuts across at the island of Jeju in South Korea. That is the South Korean air defense identification zone. Uh, and um, that also uh, excluded a very important uh, submerged uh, rock formation called Ledo. Uh, the Chinese call this Suyan, the Suyan Reef, or Ledo Reef. And so as a, as, a, as a reaction to the Chinese imposition of this new air defense zone, and Mr. Producer, if you'll get ready with uh, photograph number or visual number five, what's happened is that in re recent days, let's show uh, the audience uh, uh, map number five now, if we could. What's happened is that uh, you'll, you'll see there that yellow area, and what's what South Korea has done is, uh, in reaction to China's imposition of an air defense uh, identification zone, ADIZ, Ch the Koreans have now extended theirs to cover this Lado Reef. And uh, again, it overlaps both the Chinese and now the Japanese air defense identification zone. 
Uh, let's go back now uh, to where we were. And Mike, one of the one of the things that has uh, occurred immediately when when these this air defense zone was imposed, air defense identification zone was imposed by China, is that we saw um, the governments of Japan and South Korea. Uh, immediately announced that they were going to defy and they were going to ignore this zone. I'll come to the United States in a moment. So if you recall, the Japanese government, they announced that their military flying through this zone would not be providing the Chinese identification. And uh, they instructed their commercial air carriers, Japan Airlines and ANA, uh, not to identify themselves, uh, uh, to, to follow into the the uh, strictures that the Chinese appear to be imposing. You, you recall that? Yes. Okay. And then the next step, uh, right at that time, was the South Korean government on the military side followed Japan. They were going to defy this zone. And their carriers, Korean Airlines and Asiana and perhaps some others, uh, were also going to defy this, uh, this zone. And you, you remember that? That was at the beginning. Sure. And sure. just today, the South Korean uh, uh, commercial carriers, I saw an announcement that they were now going to follow the Chinese strictures and they were going to file flight plans with China, even though they're passing through this zone. So the only mm -hmm. commercial carriers that are uh, acting in defiance of this zone uh, are the uh, Japan Airlines and ANA. Now, the, now let's come to the United States, and uh, here we have uh, a, a, what appears to be, Mike, a very schizophrenic, wires-crossed foreign policy. And uh, uh, I want to get your reaction to this, but let's just lay out the facts for the audience first. When the China, Chinese first announced the imposition of this air defense identification zone that broadly overlaps China's AD, uh, Japan's ADIZ and includes the territorial airspace over the Chinese claimed Diaoyu Islands, which the Japanese control calls Senkaku Islands. Let me pause there. And, and uh, Mr. Producer, if you'd go to uh, photographs number two and then number three, uh, just so we can show the audience what these islands really look like. Um, these are the Senkakus administered by Japan, um, and, and uh, China claims these islands. So this is what we're talking about. And when China imposed this ADIZ, what they did was state that they had all aircraft passing through this zone had to be identified, uh, flight plans had to be filed and registered with China. And my understanding was that the commercial aircraft were accepted. Uh, and I have checked this with uh, senior executives of, of American carriers, and this has been confirmed, that China did not initially intend to have commercial air traffic transiting this zone have to register. Now, Mike, did, was that your understanding as well? Uh, yes, it is. That uh, when the announcement was made, uh, the announcement was targeting uh, what was to be, or what was characterized as sort of unknown, potentially hostile aircraft, uh, aircraft that uh, was that they uh, may determine could be armed uh, or hostile, uh, but it was not intended to uh, require that uh, commercial aircraft, which are regularly scheduled flights, uh, register uh, as they pass through the zone. And so, so what happened immediately, a couple days later, is that, it, and we, there, was a, there was a lot of media coverage over this, that uh, supposedly in defiance of this zone, the United States flew two B-52 bombers out of Guam through the zone in defiance of the Chinese demand for prior notification. You recall that, Mike? Yes, I do. And um, uh, what we've learned since is that that act was, in fact, a fake act of defiance. And the reason I say it was fake was because 
the flight plans were previously filed. China was notified it was a, a training mission that had been established before, and these were aircraft that were marked and uh, carrying no defensive, no no offensive weapons at all. So uh, that's right. Uh, now, you now to the Pentagon's credit, since then uh, they have uh, done some military uh, acts uh, in defiance through this zone. There's more to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I know we're, we're setting up kind of the factual basis for this discussion. We've got a few more pieces to put into place, um, but we have some unusual things to cover about the Chinese perspective and how this zone affects some things that maybe you didn't think of, uh, like, like Taiwan. So we're going to take a short break, and uh, Mike, I'll see you on the other side of the break, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll see you then as well. Aloha. I'm Nicole Horry for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaii Foreign Trade Zone No. 9 has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBET, the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone's mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Nicole Horry. Mahalo. We're back. I'm David Day, your host here at uh, Asian Review, and we're talking about China's new ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone. Uh, with us in this program is a three-decade China hand, Mr. Michael Sikarski, uh, uh, joining us from Houston, Texas. Uh, and uh, Mike, you're still there, I'm sure. Yes, I am. Right before the break, we talked about the beginnings of, of some uh, bizarre twists in the media having to do with the U.S. response, and we, we talked about this B-52 bomber incident that uh, uh, really was not an act in defiance, even though uh, the administration in Washington would like to take credit for that. But since then, there have been some military efforts, uh, uh, sorties through the area. Uh, but, but, Mike, what I wanted to mention to you was one of the first things that occurred is that we have the Department of Defense and the Pentagon saying, we don't recognize this zone, we're not going to follow it, and we're going to fly through it in defiance. And so they seem to be following the, or, uh, the, the position of our allies, Japan and South Korea. Remember that? I do. And, yes. then, and then, then, then tell us what the State Department did at that, at that initial, at the initial juncture. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what you're uh, referring to, David. Do you, do you remember right at the beginning the State Department's position was, well, we want we want to instruct all commercial American commercial aircraft to uh, register with China uh, before they fly through, which, to me, kind of undercut the position being taken by the Pentagon. Well, it did. It not only undercut that position, but uh, it was a, a position that no one else was taking. Uh, as you've already pointed out, uh, Japan uh, has uh, given instructions to its airlines. In fact, today, uh, the news coming out of uh, the East China Sea area today is that uh, a combined Korean-Japanese uh, uh, naval exercise took place in the zone uh, today. And uh, in, in uh, direct sort of challenge, to uh, China's exclusive claim of that area. So I, it's interesting and I, so, I suppose uh, uh, sort of mysterious as to why uh, we seem to be uh, wanting to uh, create compliance with our commercial airliners uh, when uh, no one else seems to really be doing that. And why, what the reason for that is, I don't know because uh, I can't tell you what's going on in, in Washington, D.C. But I can say this, David, that this area is a area that has been under uh, comprehensive surveillance by all the parties concerned for decades now. Uh, you cannot fly across this area. You know it's a very small area. Right. And for anyone who's ever flown from, um, let's say, uh, Fukuoka to uh, Shanghai, you're really uh, just about an hour, depending on whether you have a headwind or, not, or a tailwind. 
uh, you may get there even a few minutes earlier. So it's very uh, easy to, to move across this area because it's such a small area. So for decades now, all the powers have uh, had a tremendous uh, surveillance. They know who's going through that area minute by minute. And uh, so there's no, I, I think what took people by surprise was China's sudden declaration, which literally came overnight, uh, that they had established this zone. Uh, because for uh, several years now, uh, there's been cooperation, there's been uh, uh, a sort of a regional approach to managing traffic through this area. And as far as anybody knows, there's no threat of any military strike against China. Uh, no one is, seems to be planning a sneak attack. The kind of things that would prompt a, com a country to want to declare uh, a zone. So uh, I think that <clears throat> makes the U.S. State Department position even that more quizzical uh, as to uh, why they've done what they've done. Well, you know, Mike, the, the, the orig originally, my understanding in taking a look at the Chinese announcements was that, that they're, they're, they were not intending to have commercial aircraft uh, affected okay. or registered by the zone. So what the State Department did is hand China an enormous PR or political victory. And I, I will add, as a consequence of the State Department uh, making this announcement, I just checked today. Now there are commercial airliners from uh, air, uh, airlines from 19 countries, 55 airlines that are now complying with China's new ADIZ. I mm -hmm. mean, it's just it just the the now now to 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 add confusion or insult to injury. We've talked about the initials. Pentagon position of defiance, the State Department position of com compliance, and then just recently when Vice President Biden was in, in, in Japan, the senior U.S. military official in the United States, General Martin Dempsey, makes the statement that, uh, well, maybe we'll allow you to keep your your ADIZ if you withdraw the, the, the registration requirement. So, uh, you know, on the Pentagon or Defense Department side, he's reversing the total defiance position. And then while General Dempsey was making that announcement, the State Department is making a st statement that we don't recognize this zone. I mean, which end is up, Mike? Yeah, well, again, uh, the, the zone itself has no, what, what makes that uh, situation even more confounding is that the zone really has no functionality. Uh, it is a claim by China, uh, sort of a first claim, if you will, uh, by China. And it's not really the air that they're concerned about. Uh, it is the uh, ocean and what's under the ocean. All right, let me stop you, Mike. Let me stop you right there. Go back and look at, and Mr. Producer, if you will follow with me here, let's put photograph number one back up on the screen for our audience. And Mike, you've got that in front of you. Um, here. The, you're talking about the, the base motivation. What's pushing China out into the East China Sea and what you're saying is it's not really a, a defense of the, of, the, of the motherland concept. It, it likely has to do with this dark, uh, uh, like a multi-egg shaped uh, blob in the center of this map, which is the, uh, one of the recognized fossil fuel deposits in the East China Sea, and I, correct me on the name if I've got it wrong, uh, Chunshao, the Chunshao gas yes. field. Right, so uh, what they're claiming, what they're really doing is uh, they're they're, they're claiming everything from under the sea to over the sea. And, and of course, the claims under the sea are uh, contestable, um, are uh, being challenged by Japan and, and Korea. And so sort of to add good measure to their claim, uh, they now have, they've claimed the airspace as well. 
And so uh, they're, they're strengthening their claim. The other thing, too, is if you look at that map, you'll see that that big uh, red area that you have there, it's like a stopper in a bottle. Uh, and what that illustrates is the fact that uh, most of China's strategic commercial shipping, as well as military, of course, but strategic commercial shipping passes through that uh, area. And if you see the position of Korea, South Korea, Japan, uh, they could uh, very easily, if, if they were ever so inclined, there's no indication anybody's going to do that. But uh, the geography of the matter is that that is now a uh, very vulnerable strait as far as China's concerned for moving ship traffic in and out of Shanghai, Qingdao, uh, Tianjin, uh, Dalian. Uh, and so I think there are two reasons why they have claimed this area. Uh, the one that we just talked about, the minerals and natural resources, and the other is to uh, lay claim to keep uh, that uh, channel open and keep threats away, particularly uh, the U.S. Navy. You know, Mike, you've talked about earlier, uh, and then the, the map certainly illustrates this, um, the, the, what, a, what a congested, crowded area this is. And related to that, that uh, discussion that we just had, um, would, you, would you address the topic a little bit about the whole concept of, uh, of, of red lines that, that we in the United States used to have and put meaning behind it and, and the relationship of having real red lines to, to peace and stability and security. Right. Um, I just uh, Before I do that, let me just add one thing. When you look at these uh, respective zones, whether it be China, Japan, or Korea, uh, they remind me, the shape of these zones uh, remind me of gerrymandered congressional districts in the U.S. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And and they're shaped that way, of course. Uh, in this case, uh, to uh, cover the the the, the mineral and uh, natural resource deposits. So just the shape of these three ADZs tells you what the real intent of the ADZ uh, uh, is. But um, uh, with with regard to red lines. Um, I think that what we also see here is that uh, the U.S. perhaps in the last few years uh, has not established very clear red lines, not only in Asia but uh, around the world. And I think there have been situations and conditions where countries like Russia, China, uh, Syria are emboldened by what appears to be uh, are evaporating red lines. And, and the way they measure whether or not they're solid or evaporating uh, is the degree of, of commitment uh, to that area. And certainly we've had uh, red lines in Iraq and we've had a, a red line in uh, Afghanistan, but uh, there are other red lines out there as well. and. Uh, so I think part of what has happened here is that the Chinese perceive that our red lines in Asia as to uh, where we draw the line, that those lines are, have weakened and have diminished, and now they're challenging that. To some extent, uh, I think what they're looking for also, David, is where is our red line? Okay. Because really... Um, Two powers have uh, uh, a stable relationship when they know where each other's red lines are. And to some extent, the Chinese are, are sort of testing us to find out for themselves where is the American red line. So uh, there's certainly their own self-interest that we've already talked about behind this, but there's also a degree of inquiry uh, as to where we're at. And so to some extent, they're forcing, they want to force a response from us 
in order to see uh, if we are still <laughs> considering this to be a red line or not. And, and so that's why when the State Department uh, advises uh, uh, commercial aircraft to do something they really don't have to do, uh, it sends a signal that uh, we don't really know where our red line is anymore. That's, you know, Mike, that is a, a very, um, very profound, fascinating, and it's frightening because what you're really saying is that the U.S. red lines in a lot of places in the world, including in this, this area where we have a, a mutual defense treaty with, with uh, Japan, or we have a defense treaty with Japan, is gone from a red line to maybe a dotted pink one. Uh, right. Well, we've got to we've got to take a short commercial break here, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You're watching Asia in Review or listening to it, as the case may be. I'm your host, David Day. Our guest is uh, Michael Sikarski, the uh, the CEO of um, Pacific Enterprise Capital. And uh, we'll see you on the other side of the break. We'll talk about some very very interesting aspect of this China ADIZ that you haven't heard before. And this has to do with Taiwan when we come back. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel for ThinkTech. For nearly half a century, the Hawaiian Foreign Trade Zone, number nine, has brought the benefits of the Foreign Trade Zone program to Hawaii businesses and entrepreneurs. DBED, the Hawaii Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism, operates Hawaii's Foreign Trade Zone program. It does so to encourage international business and economic development. The Foreign Trade Zone mission is to increase the amount of international trading activity in Hawaii, thereby providing employment opportunities for the residents of our island state. For more information, see ftz9.org. I'm Jay Fidel of ThinkTech. Mahalo. We're back. Okay. We're on the air. I'm your host, David Day. You're watching Asian Review. We're talking about the China ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone. And uh, with us uh, from Houston, Texas, is Mr. Michael Sikarski. Uh, Michael is a, a three-plus decade old American, I shouldn't use the word old, young American uh, executive, entrepreneur, uh, with uh, that three-plus decades being in China and so providing us with a very unusual perspective. Um, uh, let's go, uh, Mr. Producer, to, uh, well, let me, let, let me set this up first. You know, one of the things, ladies and gentlemen, that you've heard throughout this, this whole discussion, media reports and commentators about the new China ADIZ is Japan, 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 a little bit about Korea. And uh, what we want to share with you next is a piece that relates to Taiwan. And so um, um, let's go, Mr. Producer, to uh, photograph uh, number 91A, if we could. And uh, folks, let me explain what this is. Uh, and Mike, uh, you, you, you have this one in front of you, I'm sure. This, yes, I do. This, ladies and gentlemen, is an aircraft instrument vector map. Uh, in which we have uh, simply, uh, uh, the lines are very light, and we have colored in the borders of the new China ADIZ. You can see that there with the red border, and where it comes in to uh, close down to Taiwan. Now, one of the things that has, has not been discussed is, uh, with relax, relationship to this issue, is its impact on Taiwan. And so if we were to take that same website, which is what we did, and we simply zoom in, we would get uh, a, a photograph, uh, the next photograph, which is uh, uh, the one with the purple lines on it. Now, Mike, I want to represent to you what, what we did here with this. We simply zoomed in, and those uh, purple lines that come into Taipei are the landing vectors or routes, if you will, air paths uh, for commercial aircraft coming into Taiwan um, and, and, and into, into the international airport there, Taipei. And I will further represent to our audience that the only vectors that run down the side of Taiwan there are uh, ones that go to the southern part of the island to Kaohsiung, Kaohsiung and uh, or on to Hong Kong, which is Chinese territory. So what are we saying here? Basically, all commercial aircraft 
coming in or out of Taipei cross through this new China ADIZ? And the extent to which those countries are now going to uh, provide identification, uh, when I look at this map, one of the conclusions that I draw, and uh, some senior American commercial aviation executives draw, is that China is now able to monitor all commercial aircraft in and out of Taipei. And Mike, you have some reaction to this? or? comment on it? Well, I, yeah, I do. And, and uh, what it does is to set up a, a de facto uh, degree of sovereignty because uh, while China does not have actual uh, sovereignty, if you will, or uh, legal uh, possession of Taipei or of Taiwan, uh, by setting up sort of this uh, fence, if you will, uh, it basically is another way to bring Taiwan uh, under uh, Beijing's control. There are already many ways that they're doing it through investment and, and cooperative programs. There's a lot of de facto uh, uh, tissue, connective tissue between Taiwan and Beijing. But this is another uh, part of that overall sort of enveloping of, of uh, Taiwan. You know, I, I want to be make sure that the, the audience uh, appreciates and understands that that many countries have these air defense identification zones and they have to do with flights transiting international airspace or over international waters coming on to the to the land itself uh, to, to within their national border within their territorial limits and as an example of this mr. producer let's go to uh, photograph number four and Mike, this is a, uh, it's a, a black and white, but it's a map of the Canadian ADIZ you can see there. And uh, on the left of your screen, you'll see the portions of the U.S. ADIZ around Alaska called the Alaskan ADIZ. And uh, right. the, the, these, the, the American ADIZ, the, the Canadian one, are intended to, to obtain identification of aircraft coming in into the country through that airspace before they hit the territorial limits. You follow me? Yes. And so if we go, if we go back to photograph number one, Mr. Producer, um, uh, you will see through this crowded airspace that we've been talking about, what China is doing is the intention is not so much to pick up air traffic coming into China, but it's the transit through that zone and so if we go back to photograph number uh, 9A, 92A, uh, Mr. Producer, um, this air traffic transiting the zone can be controlled through the fence, Mike, as, as you talked about. Uh, right. And so let's, let's take up a slightly different topic, Mike, and uh, kind of um, project uh, where, where do you think China is going to go from here with this. I mean, this is, they have had a, actually a very, very uh, successful imposition of this zone. They got some, you know, uh, schizophrenic uh, wires cross responses coming out of the United States. Uh, so um, pretty clear that it's been a successful uh, imposition so far. And uh, what, do you, what do you see coming ahead? Well, I think, uh, David, uh, the, the zone is one part of a bigger picture. Uh, and part of that bigger picture is China's overall uh, view of itself and, and where they are in the world. Uh, Deng Xiaoping is reputed to have said, I don't have the actual direct quote, but there are a number of uh, uh, sources that uh, are are quite uh, uh, reliable, uh, who indicate that he made in 1978, when China embarked upon their reform and opening to the West, uh, that uh, he is reputed to have said that uh, there will be a day of reckoning for the grievances that we have uh, meaning China, as grievances uh, that were acquired over the previous 150 years. 
but he counseled that we don't address those grievances until we're strong enough to do it. So, so and what, are, are, you, are you saying that are you saying that they're 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 going to carry this baggage of of hurts from 120 years ago forward to some time when they can effectively uh, slam back? I'm saying that is one of the threads. If you look at the big picture, and if the big picture is made up of several threads, or I guess for the more digitally literate uh, pixels, if you can imagine a lot okay. of pixels on it digital screen. Uh, this is one of the pixels. And um, so it's been 35 years since uh, 1978. Uh, a couple of generations have passed, I'm talking about generations of leadership, have passed through that 35 years. And there is a sense uh, that China has become strong enough to begin to address some of those grievances. Okay. And so I would say that um, the, the claiming of this uh, zone is part of that pixel or that thread. Now, what's interesting is that in another uh, 36 years, it's going to be the year 2049, which will be the centennial of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Okay. And China, uh, the party, uh, had already has their plan made up and drawn out as to what they want to accomplish as they move toward that centennial date. It's very symbolic uh, in China. Uh, these type of significant anniversaries are symbolic throughout Asia. And uh, so uh, there is work to do between, uh, they've done that work now the first, they're at the halfway point because it's been 35 years since 1978 and it's only 36 more years to 2049. Okay, so let me interrupt you Mike for a second. Hold on, hold on. We're gonna go to a short break and uh, and when we come back after the break, what we want to find out is what's the second 35 years going to bring, and uh, what are we looking at next following this uh, this zone? And so, ladies and gentlemen, stay with us. You're watching Asian Review. I'm your host, David Day. I'll see you on the other side of the break. Aloha. I'm Jay Fidel of Think Tech. We have some news for you. In addition to our ThinkTech TV show and our Asia in Review show on Olelo 54, as of January 1st, we're adding Community Matters to play also two hours a week. Check out thinktechhawaii.com for the specific times of each of these shows. We hope you enjoy all three. Mahalo, I'm Jay Fidel. Aloha, I'm Maria Kashem of ThinkTech Hawaii, and I want to tell you about our ThinkTech talk shows. If you didn't know it, ThinkTech streams video and audio for all of its shows live on the internet from 2 to 5 p.m. every weekday afternoon. And we replay them all night long on Ustream.tv. Visit ThinkTechHawaii.com for our live stream and YouTube links. Raise your awareness on ThinkTech. I'm Maria Kashem. And We're back. I'm David Day. You're watching Asian Review, our program, China's new ADIZ, and our guest uh, from Houston, Texas, Mr. Michael Sikarski, and so uh, if you just joined the program, hopefully you'll you'll pick up because we were talking about the hundred-year centennial uh, coming up in 2049 with the uh, founding of the People's Republic of China. And uh, Mike, you were talking about this halfway point and where we go from here. Well, uh, as as this 100-year period unfolds, uh, that blends in with the uh, Chinese habit of doing things in threes. Uh, and uh, what uh, we can expect is that the East China Sea ADIZ is the first of the threes. Uh, there's a second step to follow, and presumably that second step may be another ADIZ in the South China Sea. All right, hold it right a second there. Mr. Producer, would you put up photograph number six, please? Uh, 
And uh, these are the claimed areas in the South China Sea uh, between Vietnam, Philippines, <laughs> Taiwan, Malaysia, and uh, I've already missed one, Brunei. Um, go ahead, Mike. And, and the second uh, ADIZ is likely to be more hardened than the first one. The first one's kind of mushy and soft, and you've got people flying through it and joint naval exercises and that sort of thing. Uh, but the second one is likely to be much more hardened, uh, greater application. And then the third step, uh, that's the step really to begin kind of wondering what's that third step going to be and All my right, hold, sense is hold, hold it mike hold off on the third yeah. one just for one second here mr producer um uh would you put up photograph number seven because mike this is uh kind of bolstering what you were saying here about the second step being in the south china sea during this whole um crisis or or excitement if you will over the east china sea China has sent its lone aircraft carrier to the South China Sea as some type of statement. And uh, what statement that is, I'm not sure, but it's that uh, at least that, w that we are here, that we count. And Mr. Producer, uh, get ready with photograph number eight. But ladies and gentlemen, on this photograph of the uh, China's uh, sole aircraft carrier, the uh, Liaoning, uh, Mike, notice that there's no... Uh, no aircraft on that deck? Right. It's, uh, I, I, and they still have not gotten to full uh, operations yet. They, they've claimed a state of operation, but it's a very low level of operation. And now photograph number eight, Mr. Producer. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, I'll represent to you, this is a photograph from uh, China News Service taken on the, the, uh, the deck of the uh, Liaoning as she's headed toward the South China Sea, which is the second more hardened uh, ADIZ or effort that uh, Mr. Sikarsky is talking about that we're likely to see China uh, following its success in the East China Sea. So now we come to the third one, Mike, and we're just about out of time, but uh, let's, take a, let's take a minute here and, uh, and wind up with that one. What do you see as the third step that China is going to take? Well, the third step uh, may not be an ABIZ. Uh, the third step may be uh, a projection, a force projection, uh, way beyond the uh, typical definition of an ADIZ. And of course, that projection is aimed at the U.S. Navy. Uh, so I'm thinking the third step may be a super band, if you will, or super territorial claim uh, that will be intended to push the uh, U.S. Navy further out into uh, the Pacific. So some type of, of hardened ADIZ that goes for airspace all the way down to uh, surface and perhaps below, but well outside of China's territorial limits. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you so much for uh, taking the time and joining us. Uh, it's always wonderful to talk with you. I look forward to seeing you when you get back to, uh, to Hawaii here. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're out of time. Please have a safe drive home. You've been watching uh, Asian Reviews, uh, China's new ADIZ or Air Defense Identification Zone. I'm your host, David Day. I'll join you next Thursday. Uh, for another program, and Thursday, Tuesday afternoon, you can see my co-host, uh, Hong Jing, uh, who also hosts Asian Review. Please have a safe drive home. Mm -hmm.